when you Google speed cubing, the definition that Wikipedia gives is speed cubing is a competitive sport involving solving the Rubik's cube as quickly as possible. But what lies beneath this simple sentence is a whole world of techniques, different speed cubes, finger positions, also known as finger tricks, and so on. The deeper you dive into the subject, the more complex it gets. So complex that the current world record by Max Park stands at an unbelievable 3.13 seconds. But this video is not about how Max Park achieved that time, but how the cube itself is connected to one of the most useful branches of mathematics, group theory. Let's have a first look at the cube. The cube is made up of 26 smaller cubes that are also called cubits apparently, and a cord that connects the centerpieces of all six sides. That means, even if a turn was made, the center of that size stays in place. The cube has two different kinds of cubits, corner and edge pieces. Every piece with two sides is an edge and every piece with three sides is a corner. To make it easier on themselves and to share move sequences, speed cubers label the sides of the cube with F, R, U, B, L and D. If a turn is clockwise we use one of those letters and if it's counterclockwise we add a little apostrophe. This is called R prime. For a double turn, you just write a 2 behind it without an apostrophe, since R2 equals R2 prime. So in total, the move sequence R U R prime U prime looks like this. For clarification, the prime is the same as a negative one in the exponent. Before we can begin with group theory, it is important to clarify what we will consider a turn on the cube. Cubers have developed standards called turn metrics, such as half turn metric or quarter turn metric. These give us a common ground to clarify what is a turn and what not. For this video I will use the half turn metric. This means that a normal 90 degree as well as a 180 degree turn of an individual layer counts as one move. Well, the first question that naturally arises is, what is group theory? Group theory is a branch of mathematics that looks at how things can be combined or transformed. It focuses on studying the properties and relationships of these combinations called groups. Something, or rather anything, is a group if it follows four important rules, or to use the fancy mathematician word, axioms. An axiom is an unprovable statement. We just assume it to be true and deduce all other statements from it logically. The first axiom is closure. Connecting one element of the group with another one, we will get a third element of the group. A, B and C are all elements of the group G. That's it. The thing about axioms is, they seem extremely trivial, but their importance for rigorous math is not to be underestimated. The second axiom of group theory is associativity. When connecting more than two elements of a group, it doesn't matter which elements get connected first. So connecting A with B and C is the same as connecting A and B with C. The third axiom is the neutral element, although the English people more commonly call it the identity. This element is special because it does nothing. If you connect anything with the identity or the identity with anything, the result will always be anything. Fourth, for every element of the group there exists an inverse element. This is denoted with a negative one in the exponent. This axiom is similar to undoing an operation. Connecting an element with its inverse leaves the neutral element, like adding 1 and then subtracting 1, leaving you with 0. Similarly to the negative 1 notation for the inverse, if you connect A with itself a lot of times, it is commonly abbreviated with A to the n, where n is the number of times the element got connected with itself. This notation should ring a bell, since it's like exponentiation. Also, the order of a group is the number of elements in G. If a group satisfies commutativity, that means A connected with B is the same as B connected with A, it gets the privilege of being called an abelian group. I want to clarify what I mean by the word connect, because depending on the context, a connection looks very different in different groups. It can be a rotation, shoveling things, an addition, or in the case of the cube, turning two different layers one after another. A great way to think about this connection that fits almost every group is to think in actions. Action 1 gets executed first, then action 2 and so on. So for the cube we get turning layer 1, for example an R turn, then turning layer 2, for example an U turn and so on. A proof I like is the uniqueness of the neutral element. In every group is only one neutral element. 
To prove this, we can use a simple proof by contradiction. Suppose there are two neutral elements in a group. Let's call them E1 and E2. Now we simply connect them. Since connecting anything with a neutral element from both sides leaves it B, we can write E1 equals E1 connected with E2 equals E2. And we now see that E1 equals E2. This can't be true, because we explicitly said E1 does not equal E2 in the beginning. Therefore, only one neutral element exists in a group. But let's get back to the cube. Before doing anything with it, we have to make sure that the cube is indeed a group. To prove this, we need to show that the Rubik's cube satisfies the four axioms. The first axiom is closure. The cube satisfies this, since moving one layer and then moving another layer does result in another Rubik's cube configuration. The cube also satisfies associativity, since doing for example u and then f connected with r is the same as doing u connected with f and then r. Contrary, the cube is not commutative, doing r and then f is not the same as doing f and then r. The neutral element of the cube is doing no turn. Connecting any sequence of moves with the action of turning no side leaves the cube in the same state as the sequence of moves. The inverse element is simple. We already defined the inverse as the opposite of doing a clockwise move. So doing u and then u prime returns the neutral element. Anyway, since we now know the cube is a group, there is an observation I would like to make. It's that a to the 4 equals e. Turning one side 4 times leaves the cube b. Extending this concept, we can connect both sides with a to the negative 1. To give us a to the 4 connected with a to the negative 1 equals e connected with a to the negative 1, which simplifies to a to the 3 is equal to a to the negative 1. This makes sense, since turning a layer 3 times clockwise is the same as turning it once counterclockwise. Applying a to the negative 1 again, we get a to the 2 equals a to the negative 2. This is what I mentioned at the very beginning of the video. We would never write r2 prime since it is just r2. There are two different groups you could call the Rubik's cube group, the legal Rubik's cube group and the illegal Rubik's cube group. I'm going to name the illegal group gi and the legal group gl. The difference between the two being that the illegal Rubik's cube group allows the solver to take the cube apart and rearrange the qubits. Therefore, the illegal cube has way more possible arrangements than the legal group. The order of gi is this mess that ends up getting us this huge number. But how do we get to this number? First, we have to split the cube up into corner and edge pieces. A corner and an edge can never swap places, even in the illegal cube group. So we will look at the corners first. Each corner has three sides, which means that each of the three sides can be front side. Since we have 8 corners with 3 sides that can be front each, we get the number of possible twists of the corner pieces equaling 3 to the 8. But the corners can also be arranged in various positions on the cube. Which corner is the top left one, which the bottom right, and so on. This number is 8 factorial. Factorial is a function that takes the number and multiplies every integer smaller than it. So 8 factorial equals 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. But why? Let's consider a cube with all 8 corners not placed. There are 8 possibilities where the first corner can be placed. For each of these 8 positions, the second corner can be placed in 7 different locations. So to place 2 corners in 8 possible locations yields a total of 8 times 7 equals 56 combinations. Continuing with the third corner, we get 6 possible positions left, which gives us 8 times 7 times 6. If we continue that pattern for 8 pieces, we get 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. The edges are basically the same. The only thing that changes is that we have 12 edges and each of them has only 2 sides. So we get 2 to the 12 for 12 edges with 2 sides and 12 factorial for 12 possible locations. More interesting is the legal Rubik's cube group though, since that is how you would normally solve a cube. The legal Rubik's cube group is the illegal Rubik's cube group but with three restrictions that reduce the total number of possible arrangements. These restrictions are 1, R2 and R3 are a single corner twist, a single edge flip and two swap pieces. Corner or edge doesn't matter, but as soon as two corners and two edges are flipped, it is possible to solve the cube again. 
So, if we put the corners in one by one, and the last one has to be oriented correctly, this removes choices by a factor of 3. For the edges, the last one has to be oriented right as well, so we have to divide by a factor of 2. And for the swapping, we have to divide by a factor of 2 again, since putting in the last two pieces has two choices and we need the correct one. So in total, the number of possibilities is 43 quintillion. Let's look at move sequences a little closer. If you do the moves r, u, r prime, u prime, you will end up with a somewhat scrambled cube. Doing the sequence again, we get a differently scrambled cube. But repeating that sequence a few more times, 4 to be exact, we end up with the original state of the cube. Or the famous TikTok or YouTube shorts, low quality videos that claim to have found the solution to every scramble and then just turn R and U repeatedly, until they get to the end. This method is completely fake by the way, but they can do it because they know repeatedly doing the same sequence of two moves returns the cube to its original state. So they do R U a few times, hit record, do them again and end up with a solved cube. This statement is quite powerful though. Do any sequence of moves on the cube enough times it will return to its original state. Let's prove this so you can call out all those fake cube solving tutorials. So where do we start? There are infinitely many move sequences we would have to check and that is impossible. Just taking the R move we can build more sequences repeating R 2, 5 or even 100 times. The key observation we already made was that there definitely exist sequences that return the cube to its original state and we can describe them effectively. The simplest being a to the 4 equals e. So actually every sequence with for example only r can be categorized into four general cases that leave the cube in one of four states when performed. So applying r one million times is the same as doing nothing. Neat. That means a lot of sequences do the same thing than another one would. We already know that the cube has a finite number of states it can be in. That's the order of the legal Rubik's cube group. So, many of our infinite sequences get the cube from state 1 to state 2. If those moves do the same, we would only need to consider one. That means we just need one sequence for every one of the finite states of the cube and we have reduced our infinitely many sequences down into a group with finitely many elements. This is huge, because now we can use a group theory fact that will help us greatly. This theorem will help us. If capital G is a finite group and G is element in capital G, then G to the n equals E for some n. Let's unpack this. We have a group with a finite order, capital G, and small g is any element in this group. Then connecting g a finite number of times with itself, n times to be precise, we return to the neutral element, no matter the group element g. To prove this we need the pigeonhole principle. This just states, if we have some number of items and some number of choices, and we have more items than choices, some choice has to be picked twice. Simple. So we have our group capital G with the element lowercase g. Now we construct a new set named S. It contains g to the 0, g to the 1, g to the 2 and so on. This is an infinite set, but our group is finite. So by the pigeonhole principle, the number of items, g to the 0 and so on, is larger than the order of our group, which is finite. So some repetition of g, that we will call g to the i, has to be equal to some other repetition of g, that we will call g to the j, where i is less than j. Now we connect both sides with the inverse of g to the i, so that we have the neutral element on one side and g to the j minus i on the other side. So repeating g some number of times, in particular j minus i times, is the same thing as doing nothing. So how do we apply this theorem to the cube? We already constructed our finite group with all sequences we need to reach every possible state of the cube beforehand. That means that the theorem above is applicable and we are guaranteed to return to the neutral element when we repeat any sequence of moves. If you want to check how many times you need to repeat a move sequence to return to the original state, check out this website. It is a lot of fun to play around with and just shows how much more can be achieved when group theory is applied to the cube. 
I don't really know what to say for the outro, but this video was so much fun to create. Ever since SOME1 was announced, I've wanted to make a video but lacked the topic. This year was different and I'm very happy that it happened. A major hurdle was that English isn't my first language, so excuse any mistakes. In the end, I'm just your average Cuba who decided to make a video about one of his favorite toys. So thank you very much for watching and have a great day.